The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, abridged by Taylor Seth Hall. In one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, there lies a small market town in New York, which by some is called Greensburg, but is better known by the name of Terrytown. Not far from this village there is a little valley which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides through it with just a murmur enough to lull one to sleep, and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquility. If ever I should wish for a retreat, whither I might escape the world and its distractions, and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know of none more promising than this little valley. This sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place is bewitched and under the sway of some mysterious power. The good people are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, frequently see strange sights, and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions, and stars shoot and meteors glare more often across the valley than in any other part of the country. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region is the apparition of a figure on horseback, without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a soldier whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of the night as if on the wings of the wind. Indeed, the most authentic historians of those parts allege that the body of the soldier, having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head, and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow is owing to his being in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Such is the general purport of this legendary superstition, and the specter is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. In a remote period of American history, that is to say around 1790, there lived a man of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or as he expressed it, tarried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of teaching the children of the vicinity. The surname Crane described him well. He was tall but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at the top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the angel of famine descending upon the earth, or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs, and it stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation, just at the foot of a woody hill. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master, as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man, and ever bore in mind the golden proverb, Spare the rod and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel monarchs of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity, and he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance so comforting to the smarting urchin that he would remember it and thank him for it the longest day he had to live. When school hours were over, he was even the companion and playmates of the larger boys, and on holiday afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home who happened to have good housewives for mothers, noted for the comforts of the cupboard. Indeed, it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils, 
The revenue arising from his school was small, and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread, for though he was thin and lank, he had the eating powers of an anaconda. But to help out his maintenance he was, according to the country custom, boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed. With these he lived a week at a time, thus going the rounds of the neighborhood, with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief. He had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable to his rustic patrons. He assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of the farm, helped to make hay, mended the fences, took the horses to water, drove the cows from pasture, and cut wood for the winter fire. He found favor in the eyes of the mothers by sitting with a child on one knee and rocking a cradle with his foot for whole hours together. In addition, he was singing master of the neighborhood, and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in Sabbath choir. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers, his voice resounding far above all the rest. Thus, by diverse little makeshifts, the worthy schoolmaster got on tolerably enough, and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy time of it. The schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood, being considered a kind of idle, gentleman-like personage, of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains. Ichabod Crane was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. How he would figure among them in the churchyard, between services on Sundays, gathering grapes for them from the wild vines, reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones, or sauntering with a whole flock of them along the banks of the mill-pond, while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying his superior elegance. Ichabod was an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. He knew all about the history of New England witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. It was often his delight, after his school was dismissed in the afternoon, to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse, and there con over direful legends of witches and goblins. Then, as he wended his way in the gathering dusk, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. His only resource on such occasions, either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits, was to sing hymns, and the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody from along the dusky road. Sleepy Hollow held marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins, and haunted fields, and haunted brooks, and haunted bridges, and haunted houses, and particularly of the headless horseman of the hollow. Ichabod listened with fearful pleasure to these stories, told by old Dutch wives as they sat spinning by the ruddy glow of a crackling fire, where, of course, no specter dared to show his face. But that pleasure was dearly purchased by the terrors of his walk homewards. What fearful shapes and shadows beset his path, amidst the dim and ghastly light? With what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window? How often was he appalled by some shrub covered with snow, which, like a sheeted specter, beset his very path? How often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps beneath his feet? and dread to look over his shoulder, lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him, and how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing wind, howling among the trees in the idea that it was the headless horseman on one of his nightly scourings. All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness. 
Daylight put an end to all these evils, and he would have passed a pleasant life of it if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together. And that was a woman. Among the musical students who assembled was Katrina Van Tassel, the daughter and only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and as rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed not merely for her beauty, but her vast expectations. She was withal a little of a coquette, as might be perceived even in her dress, which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions as most suited to set off her charms. Ichabod Crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the tempting Katrina Van Tassel, more especially after he had visited her in her father's mansion. Old Baltus Van Tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving and contented farmer. Within the boundaries of his farm, everything was snug, happy, and well-conditioned. Hard by the farmhouse was a vast barn that might have served for a church, every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm. The enraptured Ichabod rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadowlands, the rich fields of wheat and corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit which surrounded the warm home of Van Tassel. His heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains. His busy imagination presented to him the blooming Katrina with a whole family of children, and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. In this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than a knight-errant of yore, who seldom had anything but giants, enchanters, fiery dragons, and such like adversaries to conquer as easily as one carves a Christmas pie. Ichabod, on the contrary, had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette beset with a labyrinth of whims, and he had to encounter her numerous rustic admirers, who beset every path to her heart, keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other, but ready to rally together against any new competitor. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roistering blade of the name of Abraham Van Bront, the hero of the country round. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed, with short, curly black hair. From his Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship, foremost at all foot races, and was umpire in all disputes. He was always ready for either a fight or a frolic, but had more mischief than ill-will in his composition and with all his overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. He had three or four boon companions, and they all scoured the country, attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles round. In cold weather, Brom Bones was distinguished by a fur cap with a flaunting fox's tail, and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity, the neighbors always shook their heads and declared Brom Bones was at the bottom of it. This stormy hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his wooings were something like the gentle endearments of a wild bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and, considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature, yielding but tough. Though he bent, he never broke, and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, up, he carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against Brombones would have been madness. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gentle manner, under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse and would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm or sauntering along in the twilight, 
that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. Thus, a deadly feud gradually arose between Brom Bones and Ichabod Crane of Sleepy Hollow. Brom, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would gladly have carried matters to open warfare and have settled their pretensions to the lady by single combat, but Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his opponent. He had overheard Brom's boast that he would double the schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf of his own schoolhouse, and Ichabod was too wary to give him that opportunity. Brom found Ichabod's stubbornly peaceful strategy extremely provoking, and it left him no alternative but to play off rude practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney. They once broke into the schoolhouse at night and turned everything topsy-turvy, so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meeting there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning Ichabod into ridicule in presence of Katrina. Brom taught a scoundrel dog to whine in the most ludicrous manner, and introduced it to Katrina as a rival of Ichabod's to instruct her in singing. In this way, matters went on for some time, without producing any material effect on the relative situations of the contending powers. On a fine autumn afternoon at the schoolhouse, Ichabod received an invitation to attend a merrymaking to be held that evening at Van Tassel's farm. The whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time, and the students burst forth like a legion of young imps, yelping and racketing about in joy at their early emancipation. The gallant Ichabod now spent at least an extra half-hour brushing and furbishing up his best and indeed only suit of rusty black, and arranging his hair by a bit of broken looking-glass that hung up in the schoolhouse, that he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier, he borrowed a horse from a farmer of the name Hans van Ripper, and thus gallantly mounted, issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures. But it is meet I should, in the true spirit of romantic story, give some account of the looks and equipments of my hero and his steed. The animal he bestrode was a broken-down plough-horse, gaunt and shagged, with a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge him from the name he bore, Gunpowder. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like a grasshopper's, and as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on his scanty strip of forehead, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed as they shambled out the gate of Hans van Ripper. It was, as I have said, a fine autumn day. The sky was clear and serene, and the forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees wore brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air, the bark of a squirrel might be heard from the groves of hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of a quail from the neighboring fields. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets, in the fullness of their revelry, they fluttered, chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree, screaming and chattering, nodding and bobbing and bowing, and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove. As Ichabod jogged slowly on his way, his eye ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of Van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Old farmers in homespun coats and breeches, with their brisk, withered little dames, 
buxom lasses almost as antiquated as their mothers, excepting where a straw hat or a fine ribbon gave symptoms of city innovation. The sons, in short, square-skirted coats with rows of stupendous brass buttons. Rombones, however, was the hero of the scene, having come to the great gathering on his favorite steed, Daredevil, a creature like himself, full of metal and mischief, and which no one but himself could manage. Fain would I pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon Ichabod's enraptured gaze as he entered the state parlor of Van Tassel's mansion, such heaped-up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds. There were sweet cakes and short cakes, ginger cakes and honey cakes, and the whole family of cakes. And then there were apple pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies, besides slices of ham and smoked beef, and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and pears not to mention broiled fish and roasted chickens, together with bowls of milk and cream, all mingled higgledy-piggledy, with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the midst. Heaven bless the mark. I want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves, and am too eager to get on with my story. Happily, Ichabod Crane was not in so great a hurry as this storyteller, but did ample justice to every dainty. He was a kind and thankful creature, whose heart and spirits rose with eating, as some men's do with drink. He could not help, too, chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor. Old Baltus Van Tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humor, round and jolly as the harvest moon. His hospitable attentions were brief but expressive. A shake of the hand, a slap on the shoulder, a loud laugh, and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves. And now the sound of music summoned to the dance. Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fiber about him was idle and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room, you would have thought that St. Vitus himself, that blessed patron of the dance, was figuring before you in person. The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings, while Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in the corner. When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who, with old Van Tassel, sat gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war. Just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each storyteller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction, and, in the indistinctness of his recollection, to make himself the hero of every exploit. There was the story from a large blue-bearded Dutchman who had nearly taken a British frigate from a mud breastwork, only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge. And there was an old gentleman who, in the Battle of White Plains, parried a musket ball with a small sword, insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz round the blade and glance off at the hilt, in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword with the hilt a little bent. There were several more that had been equally great in the field, not one of whom but was persuaded that he had a considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy end. But all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that followed. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered, long-settled retreats. There was an infection in the very air that blew from the haunted region of Sleepy Hollow. It breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and nightmares. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were present at Van Tassel's, and, as usual, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the old trees. 
Some mention was made also of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. The chief part of the stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the headless horseman who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country and, it was said, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. Not far from the church was a wooden bridge crossing a large brook, thickly shaded by overhanging trees, which occasioned a fearful darkness at night. Such was one of the favorite haunts of the headless horseman, and the place where he was most frequently encountered. The tale was of old Brower, a disbeliever in ghosts, how he met the horseman returning from his foray into Sleepy Hollow, and was obliged to get up behind him, how they galloped over bush and brake, over hill and swamp, until they reached the bridge, when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw old Brower into the brook, and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. This story was immediately matched by a thrice marvelous adventure of Brom Bones, who made light of the headless horseman as an errant jockey. He affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village, he had been overtaken by this midnight soldier, that he had offered to race with him for a bowl of punch, and should have won it too, for his steed Daredevil beat the goblin horse all hollow. But just as they came to the church bridge, the horseman bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. All these tales, told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark, sank deep in the mind of Ichabod. The revel now gradually broke up. The old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons, and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills, some of the damsel's light-hearted laughter, mingling with the clatter of hoofs, echoed along the silent woodlands, sounding fainter and fainter, until they gradually died away. Ichabod only lingered behind, according to the custom of country lovers, to have a private chat with Katrina, fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success. What passed at this interview I will not pretend to say, for in fact I do not know. Something, I fear me, must have gone wrong, for he certainly sallied forth with an air quite desolate and dejected. Oh, Katrina, was her encouragement of this poor schoolmaster all a mere sham to secure her conquest of Brom Bones? Heaven only knows, not I. Without looking to the right or left to notice the scene of rural wealth on which he had so often gloated, he went straight to the stable, and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused Gunpowder most uncourteously from his comfortable dream. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod, heavy-hearted and crestfallen, pursued his travels homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above Terrytown, and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon. The hour was as dismal as himself. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket, or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker, the stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky, and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, nearing the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. As Ichabod approached, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast of wind sweeping sharply through the dry branches. As he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of a tree. He paused and ceased whistling, but, on looking more narrowly, perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare. Suddenly he heard a groan but it was the rubbing of one huge bough upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety, but new perils lie before him. As Ichabod moved on, his heart began to thump. 
a group of oaks and chestnuts, matted thick with wild grapevines, threw a cavernous gloom over the road. In the dark shadow of the grove, he beheld something huge, misshapen and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom, like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. The hair of the affrighted schoolmaster rose upon his head with terror. He summoned up all his resolution, gave his horse a dozen kicks in the ribs, and attempted to dash briskly past the spectre. But instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased with the delay, jerked the reins on the other side and kicked lustily with the opposite foot. It was all in vain. His steed started, it is true, but it was only to plunge to the other side of the road into a thicket of brambles and bushes. The schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel upon the starveling ribs of old Gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffling and snorting, but came to a stand with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin, if such it was, which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Summoning up, therefore, a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, Who are you? He received no reply. He repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice. Still there was no answer. Once more he cudgelled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder, and, shutting his eyes, broke forth with involuntary fervor into a Sabbath hymn. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion, and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions, and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made neither attack nor greeting, but kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old Gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no liking for this strange midnight companion, and remembered the adventure of Brom Bones with the headless horseman, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his singing, but his parched tongue clung to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a verse. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground, which brought the figure of his fellow traveller in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. His terror arose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the spectre started full jump with him. Away then they dashed through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow, but Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon, instead of keeping up it, made an opposite turn and plunged headlong down the hill to the left. This road led to the bridge famous in Goblin's story about a quarter of a mile off, and just beyond stood the whitewashed church. As yet, the panic of the steed had given Ichabod an apparent advantage in the chase, but just as he had got halfway to the bridge, the girths of the saddle gave way, and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain, and had just had time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth, and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. The horseman was hard on his haunches, and Ichabod had much ado to maintain his seat, slipping and jolting on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder. 
An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. The wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken. He saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond. He recollected the place where Brom Bone's ghostly competitor had disappeared. If I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even thought that he felt its hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer would vanish, according to rule, in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then he saw the spectre rising in his stirrups, in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, the Black Steed, and the Goblin Rider passed by like a whirlwind. The next morning the old horse was found without his saddle and with the bridle under his feet, soberly eating the grass at Hans Van Ripper's gate. The children assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook, but no schoolmaster. Hans Van Ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor Ichabod and his saddle. An inquiry was set on foot, and, after diligent investigation, they came upon his traces. In the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt, the tracks of horses' hoofs deeply dented in the road, and the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close beside it a shattered pumpkin. The body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered. The mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following Sunday. Knots of gossipers collected in the churchyard, at the bridge, and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found. The stories of the headless horsemen were called to mind, and when they had diligently considered them all, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the midnight soldier. As he was a bachelor and in nobody's debt, nobody troubled his head any more about him, and another schoolmaster reigned in his stead. It is true, an old farmer who had been down to New York City on a visit several years after brought home the intelligence that Ichabod Crane was still alive, that he had left the neighborhood, partly through fear of the horsemen and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by Katrina Van Tassel, that he had moved to a distant part of the country had studied law, turned politician, written for the newspapers, and finally had been made a justice of the ten-pound court. Brombones, too, who, shortly after his rival's disappearance, conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related, and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. The old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means, and it is a favorite story often told round the winter evening fire. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and the schoolhouse was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate schoolmaster, and the schoolchildren have often fancied hearing his voice at a distance, chanting a melancholy hymn among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. I don't believe one half of it myself.